Okay. Go. All right. Well, hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, thanks for joining us for another virtual event this evening. And we're delighted to have for the first time Alex Finlay with us. And he's going to be talking about his brand new book, What Have We Done? And uh, Alex signed a, a batch of books for us. And um, I will go ahead and put a link in the comments field if you'd like to purchase one of our signed copies. And also, if you have questions for Alex, go ahead and put them in. And Barbara will bring me back on screen towards the end of the hour. And I will be happy to uh, ask any questions you might have. So, Barbara, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. How very nice to see you, Alex. This is fun. Yeah, I, used to, I am that weird creature who read the law in Virginia, whereas you are an actual practicing lawyer in Virginia. So... It's kind of fun that we got together. Um, actually, the reason I have a bookstore is I can't I can't take the bar exam because I didn't go to law school. Oh, so you were in California or somewhere like that? Uh, no, or... I was in Virginia. But oh, Virginia. Virginia. Okay, uh, I'm a Washington. I practice in Washington D.C., so I'm not. Oh, uh, okay, because you I'm live not... in Virginia, so I yeah. sort of assumed it. No, yeah. um, back in I mean, this is a long time ago. This was back in the late seventies, but. The uh, Virginia Apprentice Attorney Program oh, okay. is really fascinating. I love doing it that way. But the hitch was that um, you can only practice law in Virginia because right. you didn't go to law school. So when I moved to Arizona, I had the choice between going to law school and opening a bookstore. <laughs> Owning a bookstore sounds a lot like, like a lot more fun. So it, it has so. been. It's been. It's really been a lot of fun. But anyway, so that's true. Practicing in D.C. So you had a. Um, you've had an interesting route towards becoming Alex Finley, author of three fabulous books, two of which I gather are going to be gracing our television screens before too long. So how did law school figure into all that? Well, uh, you know, I, uh, I moved a lot as a kid. Uh, so reading was a big thing for me. I, my father was in the military, so we moved every couple of years. And so when you move to a new base in the middle of nowhere and you have no friends in the summer, uh, you, you, you got to occupy your time, particularly pre-internet. So that's how I got involved in reading. Um, law came by accident. I was, you know, I was a terrible high school student. I thought I was going to be in a rock band and that's how I was going to make my, my, my life. Um, and so I, um, when I realized that was not to be, um, I uh, uh, thought about what I liked the most in, in college, and I had some law classes, and that led me to Notre Dame. And uh, next thing you know, I've been in practicing uh, practice law in D.C. for more than 20 years. Wow. So, you know, you're obviously interested in justice, and that undoubtedly figures into your novel. So I have to say that in this new book, your route to justice is, is certainly strewn with time bombs and other kinds of bombs, not to mention <laughs> multiple narrators. So I'm not too sure exactly where your moral compass is swinging. Right? <laughs> well, wow. I like I like complex characters. And I think one thing that a lawyer uh, teaches you to do is to understand things aren't black and white and everybody's a hero in their own story. And um, and so I try and bring some of that into my work. And I try and I do draw on the legal side a little bit um, here and there, but it my uh, uh, but, you know, for the most part, I just, my goal is just to turn the pages, create some interesting characters that hopefully people want to read about. Well, I mean, you're certainly right that everybody is the hero of his own story. Um, the also truth is that despite overwhelming evidence and other stuff, very often the best story actually wins um, in criminal trials, which is why we get some of the results that seem incomprehensible. Um, and, you know, I don't know that forensics is ever going to completely overshadow the personal element when it comes to lawyers telling stories. Yeah, I think, you know, as far as like, I get asked sometimes, well, what does uh, my legal practice influence my work? Um, you know, there, I do include some, my legal background helps with some of the stuff I do, but really I'm, I've been an appellate lawyer, which is really a writing job. Yeah. Um, and so I get the cases after they've been through the ringer of the system and somebody's unhappy and they appeal. And my job is to take this massive material, whether it's a trial that went on for a year or or a case that was dismissed, um, you know, early on. And I have to, in short order, take it all, condense it down into a story, basically, my client's story. Um, but it has to be fact based. And one of the things I like about being a novelist is, is in my law practice, if I something didn't go my way, 
you know, you have the challenge of how you're going to present the the bad facts uh, with novels. I can just kill somebody or, you know, do something. You know, <laughs> Throw them, them into a pit. There's some, there's some kind of uh, 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 catharsis from, from my, from my legal practice probably in there somewhere. Well, if you're an appellate attorney, or in fact, if you're an attorney at all, then much of your life is in fact spent writing. Um, and, you know, and, and with discipline, um, on, in the sense that, you know, you have deadlines to meet that are unforgiving. Um, and so, you know, my experience is that newspaper reporters and lawyers never really suffer from what's called writer's block, um, because, you know, you just have to soldier on. You're so used to that, that you just find another way of moving forward when- Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. You get- you know that you can't wait for inspiration. You've got a court that's going to, you know, uh, basically make you lose your case if you don't get meet the deadline. And so it, that has helped. I think just the discipline of for, you know, two decades having to um, in private practice, having to keep track of every, you know, six minutes of my life, uh, you know, for for the way that lawyers bill um, clients um, it just necessarily. Uh, create some level of, uh, of of discipline or at least, you know, time management. Absolutely so. And actually just making shit up is probably a great relief if you're mostly doing a ballot review. Right. So right. I could I could see that. Then, right. um, you know, despite your moving around, I observe you thank your wife at the end of this book for 35 happy years. So, um, you know, maybe you also learn to value stability while you. Yeah, were. yeah, maybe that's right. Or I just got lucky and I met somebody young who was foolish enough to take a <laughs> to take a gamble. But uh, yeah, my wife's a big. Uh, uh, she's one. Just you know, obviously, I've been married a long time. But but in the uh, in the uh, novel, this is a second career for me, and uh, so it's been a lot of fun for her. She's a huge reader. She's my first reader. Um, and she goes to all my events with me and we, we, we have a good, uh, you know, a good fun time with this, uh, particularly now that our, all of our kids are out of the house, our youngest just left for college. So we're, we're enjoying the emptiness so far. Well, that's true that if you're a writer, your nest is never empty because you spend all your life with imaginary friends. So, you know, there's no real, no chance. So let's talk about every last fear because you had written other books earlier, um, under a different name, what inspired you to change your name? And or did you write Every Last Fear and then you were, um, it seemed like a good move to move forward under a different name? Yeah, I mean, it was a business decision. I mean, if I'm right. just, you know, blunt about it, um, I wrote uh, three legal thrillers, which were well reviewed. Um, um, when that ended, I was kind of not really interested in writing another legal thriller. I didn't think of what else, you know, I could explore in that particular universe that I uh, had written the books in. And I started Every Last Fear. And, you know, my, both my editor um, and my agent got very excited about that book after, and uh, they thought, you know, that could be the breakout book for me. The publisher bought it on a hundred pages. Um, and, uh, it, it basic along the way, the decision was, you know, well, what, well, uh, the pen name came up and I, uh, you know, I thought about the pros and cons and ultimately I just thought it was a way to distinguish the legal thrillers and just start this kind of new, new approach I was taking to the books, which, you know, at least from my publisher and, and, and those around me's perspective was uh, a notch better than the other books. And that's really how it happened. Well, it's, it's just branding. I mean, you know, and increasingly branding is um, an important way to move forward. So, you know, creating a new brand seems to me like a smart decision. I remember Ruth Randolph, you know, and she rebranded herself as Barbara Vine or or the wonderful Barbara Mertz, who wrote as Elizabeth Peters and Barbara Michaels. And, you know, it's not the only time I ever object to it is when people try to cloak something, you know, um, and that applies to ghostwriting as well. I'm fine with ghostwriting, but I don't like it when people try to hide it. Um, it makes it hard as a bookseller because, you know, part of what we do is sort of based on honest representation. Mm -hmm. And once or twice I've had publishers try to sucker me with a rebranding. Um, and, you know, if it's not really a debut novel and mm -hmm. I say to people it is, and then all is revealed that it's not, yeah. it's a very uncomfortable place for me. So, 
Yeah, I, I found that um, the, in, only in publishing is having a fake name kind of just a run of the mill. Right. You know, in any other, in any other, you know, I've represented companies for right. decades, and I, in any other context, it's it's very strange, but it's just. Uh, and normal as anything for uh, publishers. It's taken me a lot to get used to. I still, I was at a conference uh, last weekend and I still slip up and introduce myself under my real name, which confuses people. And so I try and go in and just method act and be in character. Um, but yeah, it's, so for me, it's been, um, you know, the, the, it, it, on the whole, it's been a very positive experience. I found that uh, just, totally separating my legal career from my writing career has been beneficial. Both, I think, psychologically. I, I always thought of myself before as a lawyer who wrote books on the side. Now, I, you know, I think with the Alex Finley, the law stuff doesn't come up as much, and it's really just the writer on its own. I'm I'm out there. And, um, you know, I and there was the branding component, too. And I think the publisher really, you know, did a great job with the Alex Finley brand for whatever it's worth now. And um, so... Um, but my wife, you know, we go, she wants a pen name when we travel, you know, she wants to you know, have some fun with it. Well, so this may, this may be of interest to you. My favorite legal thriller of all time is written by a judge. Yeah. And, um, um, so, anatomy of murder. Huh? No, it, not that oh, no. one. That is the terrific one. No, oh. my guy uh, wrote is British and he, um, his real name was Alfred Alexander Gordon Clark. But um, he wrote as Cyril Hare. And um, if you give me a moment, because I'm having one of those tragedy at law is my is my personal. It's, it's an unreliable narrator. And the unreliable narrator is the judge. And written in the 1930s, this judge wow. still rode circuit preceded by trumpeters. Oh. I mean, how cool is that? No, I'll have I mean, to check this. I haven't heard of that. Well, it's funny. I thought you were going to say anatomy of murder because that was a, written by a judge who used a pen name. Uh, Robert Travers, so, right? Yeah, wrote it yeah, yeah, yeah. So. But see, he was, interestingly enough, he was an administrative judge. And then there was another another judge, similarly an administrative judge named William something, whose name I can't remember, who for your publisher wrote several, absolutely Fabulous mysteries. I think I started with an M, whatever his last name. Yeah, I kind of remember that as well. And now we have. They were um, great. They were really great. Um, And I find it interesting that lawyers write, write, you know, novels, thrillers, or other kinds of novels easily, but judges very, very rarely do. And most of the time, they are, in fact, administrative judges. So I think the judicial discretion and maybe. Uh, no, it's not William Bernhard Patrick, but thanks for asking. He wrote he wrote um, legal thrillers, but maybe he was a judge. Um, he's, a, I think, an Oklahoma lawyer or something. Anyway, my point is that I think that it's harder for judges. Yeah. Um, and um, they don't really want to be reviewed. Or Yeah, I think, you know, I can see why that would be as, you know, just from my experience, when I get a judge assigned to a case, I look into them and, you know, you might... <laughs> They might feel like they're giving away too much of themselves by, by uh, uh, in their novels, like we all do. But I do think it's getting um, easier just across the board. Uh, David Ellis is a, is a judge. Um, yeah, but he was a novelist before he was a judge. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That is true. And so yeah. he was kind of yeah. So he kind of came into it already. They knew what they were getting into, I guess. Um, but it's it's definitely it definitely I think being a judge is uh, a different scenario than being a lawyer for sure. Right. And how wonderful that we get great stories. Robert Dugoni, who is a lawyer, has just written a fabulous, we talked last week, um, a, a legal thriller. Because in fact, for some reason, legal thrillers kind of, you know, how genres rise and fall. Um, and a legal thriller kind of took a downer. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. I was there, a, personally. An amazing legal thriller, um, whatever it's called. Um, it was on the back page of the New York Times Book Review on Sunday. But anyway, I'm happy to see, you know, legal thrillers. But I really want to talk about, now that we've wasted all this time talking no. about other stuff, I really want to talk about this book. But we have one more book before every last fear. Oh, so sure. tell us about your second book, and then we'll hit this one. Oh, sure. The second book, um, which was my dreaded, you know, I was dreading the sophomore slump that everyone was warning me about, um, was The Night Shift. Um, it was a story about uh, 
uh, started on New Year's Eve 1999 in a blockbuster video. A group of teenage employees are attacked at a video store, and there's only one survivor. And then 15 years later, same town at an ice cream store, similar attack, one survivor. And the story is about the, um, whether there's a connection between the crimes and the two survivors get together um, to kind of uh, uh, explore uh, and, and resolve what really happened on both nights. So if you noticed any uptick in confusion with the night agent by my dear friend, Matthew Quirk, which is, you know, top of the charts. At yeah, night I, night I, night? I, I, no, I, well, I haven't, um, but I, but I. You uh, can see it sort of. Yeah, I watched the night, I read the, the, the night agent and I liked the show. I haven't finished it yet. Um, I don't see the parallels to the night, sh the, other than the title, the night show. No, it's just the title. That's yeah, all yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh and that wasn't the, the original title. My title was different than the night shift. The publisher uh, came up with the better title than I than I had. But yeah, um, but I, I there's a movie I'm told to from the 80s called The Night Shift with Michael. King. And then there's Lacari's The Night Manager, which oh, is really manager, very yeah. good also. But yeah. the reason I was laughing is that, you know, when the girl on the train was mm -hmm. um, was such a hit, there was an author who wrote, what was it, The Girl? on the train anyway whatever it was she became an <laughs> accidental bestseller because people kept clicking kept the wrong. Wrong That's a, yeah <laughs> so i thought that maybe you know the yeah there, there no there was, there was no uh there was no i i hadn't thought of it at the time it was not my title but you you know i i i liked the title the moment i heard it but um it's like uh uh, Bob Woodward had his original nonfiction book about the Supreme Court called The Brethren. And then John Grisham, of course, years right. later, came out with The Brethren. And I always like Bob Woodward said, it, um, he immediately told his publisher to make his cover look more like Grisham's. You know, so it's kind of like what you were right. saying with, well, with the girl on a train. So. You know, it's 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 harder today, too, when people are clicking on things. You know, we I see it every day. I mean, you know, people, because we have such a huge internet business, and people click on the wrong thing all the time. And I sit there, or we all sit there, we go, hmm, <laughs> is that really what they meant to order? Or should we fix that? But we'll see. Anyway, what have we done? Now, why? It's really ambitious to have so many narrative voices. What what interested you in telling the <laughs> yeah. story from? I think it's is it five different perspectives? Oh wow, that's, I, I think there's three main perspectives, and then we have a couple of the, the, at least the two twins, more. the twins uh, who are the who are some um, <laughs> the contract host. Um, yeah, I but would... you also have you also have Artemis. So Artemis... oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. I think just at one point in the book, but I I think yeah, mostly it's it's the three three of yeah. the five friends. Jenna and Nico and um, um, Donnie, the right. rock star Donnie. And yeah. I thought when I started it that Jenna was really going to be the principal narrator of this book, but yeah, I mean, I, I like to do multiple narrators. All of my books have had them. This one, um, and the the setup for anyone you know who hasn't you know heard of it is basically it's a group of. Uh, you know, 25 years ago, a group of teenagers are residents of this uh, foster care home for for parentless teens, and they kind of become the best of friends, uh, you know, basically forged, you know, forged through the trauma of what they experienced at this at this group home. And the home is shut down and then um, they haven't seen each other in two decades. They've all gone on to have strangely accomplished lives. And. Uh, they're reunited because someone's killing them one by one. And so the book, as Barbara mentioned, is told, um, it's about these five kids, but the main narrators are um, uh, three of them. Um, and we learn about the, you know, the story of of what happened to them. And they have to go back and kind of face, face their past to, you know, really uncover who's out to get them and why. And oh, you have a dramatic opening sort of a prologue where we see the the teenagers you know are well they're obviously doing something that's going to reverberate in later <laughs> right. life um yeah. how does jenna then get recruited by what you call the corporation is this is such a greg herwitz moment you know? yeah well no i say in the acknowledgments you know i, I so i have my three narrators one is a um i you know i'll, I'll give a little backstory it's like the, the the genesis for this whole you, you know scheme was um, I've been reading a lot of Malcolm Gladwell 
who, for those who don't know, he writes nonfiction, just really interesting. He incorporates social science and, but a lot of great storytelling and profiles of individuals and explores all these great questions. Why, do, why are people successful? How do we communicate? And um, one of the, the um, things that, that stuck out to me was, is he has a discussion about how um, a lot of studies show that people who lost their parents at a young age, there's a lot of them who turn out to be just uber successful, you know, and you look at like, you know, a third of all the prime ministers have been, uh, uh, had uh, uh, a, a parent die when they were young, U.S. presidents, Supreme Court justices, and, you know, you can go through, down the line and, and there's no real, you know, it's correlation, not causation kind of situation, but it was an interesting kind of nugget for me and that got the idea flowing. And, you know, the, the other aspect of it was was interesting to me too is is that it's really not it's a flip of a coin like prisons are filled disproportionately with people who lost a parent at a young age so what is it that makes some people just kind of excel and some people um, go the other direction and so when I was thinking about having a story about kids who something happens and who are separated and years later um, have to be reunited um, I, that was the idea I wanted them to to have experienced this trauma, but really come out of it super accomplished, but still damaged. And so that led me to think about, well, what would these careers be? I didn't just want to be conventional, successful people like doctors or whatever. Um, so I thought, well, I, I could have one be a reality TV producer. And that was more laziness on my part because I have a good friend who is a reality TV producer of a show called Gold, Gold, Gold Rush. And so that gave me access to somebody with kind of who could give me some inside stuff on that world. And then I had a uh, kind of an 80s rock star who is now playing cruise ship is the Donnie character who I really love. That's one of my favorite, favorite characters I've written, probably because I was in a rock band when I was young and, and experienced a lot of characters like him. And then I thought, well, the last character, I want something really over the top. And so I made the Jenna character, and not to give too much away, but you know, from the outward appearances, she's a stepmom of a of a couple kids. She lives in an affluent DC suburb, and she just she looks like you know, um, you know, she's just a, a living that kind of lifestyle. But she has this past where she was recruited from that foster home um, into a government kind of or contractor type group that does. Uh, basically um, contract assassinations. And for that, it was really just inspired by Jason Bourne, Nikita, Orphan X, you know, I could go Ooh. on. And I and I I like those that those books. And so I thought it would be fun to 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 play with it myself. And um so that's you know that was where it all kind of came from. Well it you know it'd be hard to take a 15 year old with two parents in sort of a normal life and suck them into something called the corporation and train them to be government. Right, right, right. And the, my other goal with this book was, um, was every last fear and both the night shift were multi uh, perspective. So it's similar in that respect, but I wanted to do something a little more actiony this time. And Jenna was the vehicle for that. And so that's really, I mean, if I had to say the difference between the three books, um, this one is much more, uh, I try and get into the backstories of the characters and, and do the things that I did in the other books, but really she's the driver of kind of propelling the, the plot forward and making it hopefully a fast moving, um, uh, both psychological thriller, but really action story as well. Oh, you have some really, she has some pretty nifty moves. Um, <laughs> and, you know, do you, are you the sort of person who can sort of block out an action scene in your head or, you know, how, I mean, because some of these kind of fight scenes you know you have to really you do have to block it out to make it seem real to the reader yeah I mean some of it is just putting yourself imagining yourself in a situation how would you get out of um certain situations I have a you know I have some opening in the book she's in a scene where she's in downtown DC and she has to get out of this hotel and I just went to this my law office is in downtown so I just use that street and went to the uh, hotel there and looked at and just imagine like if you're somebody who really athletic like Jenna is how you would get out of this situation um I'm terrible at fight scenes I get help from I have a um 
one of my really good friends is an author named Barry Lancet who wrote oh, right. the Japantown series and he knows martial arts and and he he's just much better in that sphere so he he helps me with 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 uh some of that um and otherwise you just kind of have fun and you know play with it and and hope that it's not too over the top Barry's a wonderful writer. I've been sad not to see him for some time. I loved his Japan-based books, and it's been some time since he's. Yeah, written. yeah, no, he's. I haven't, you know. I see him. I used to see him every year at Thriller Fest. We would, you know, get to hang out because he's in Japan. Um, but he's working on new new material, and I suspect we'll see him out soon because he's he's really a great great talent and, he and just a great talent. he's a great friend. And this is one of the things for me is is coming as this is a second career for me you know, the last 20 years or so, all my friends have been lawyers or people associated with my firm or this or that. And, you know, getting to be part of the writing community has been just a really, uh, uh, you know, without being too kind of uh, cheesy about it, it's been really the jo one of the joys of my life, just meeting the, the writers are just a really supportive group. And I've made some of the closest friends I have in a very short period of time in this community. It is a wonderful community. People often say to me, so I'm, you know, because I'm so old, why don't you retire? And, you know, that's one of the reasons they don't. Um, you know, successful aging in part is is staying active and having community. And it's hard to beat um, a writer's community or the book world. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful place to be and constantly stimulating. And thanks to Zoom, we can even make connections that, you know, we couldn't make before. Let's go back to that whole question. I've often brought that up. And I think about Dickens and Oliver Twist. You know, why is it that one orphan boy can turn into Fagin or, you know, whatever? And somebody else can be Oliver Twist, you know? Um, and I, I, you know, that whole nature-nurture debate. Um, goes on are some people just born with a you know a no, I, you know I think it's I, I think the people who study this are still, <clears throat> still don't have an answer to it no. um, and I you know I, I I think it's probably a confluence of of things I think uh, you know just like any we're all products of our environments and our experiences that losing a parent's probably one of the defining experiences when you're young and maybe everything that led up to that, um, it makes a different path of which, you know, uh, uh, makes a difference in the path that you, that you take. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question. And it's, uh, and I've, you know, um, I haven't read all the study. I'm basically, you know, got the idea from Malcolm Gladwell, who condenses the, right. the literature on it. But I imagine there's a, the, there might be more to learn on the, if you went to the source material. Which I have well, I think as I think as neuroscience progresses, um, you know, and genetic science progresses, now we're going to find out a lot more things. Yeah, um, no. you know, than we than we currently know. This is an interesting question that um, Megan Miranda and I are going to be discussing a week from Saturday on the fifteenth because her new book is based upon an accident, um, a fatal accident, as it happens for a number of people, and gradually you learn how some of the people reacted at the time, how some of them made decisions about who to save and how that reverberates in the present, not, not well um, for many of them. And, you know, and that, that's a really tough question, you know, in a life and death situation, who would the ordinary person choose to save? Yeah. Would it be yourself? Would it be someone else? And, you know, some people are heroes, you know, and elect to go for someone else and other people, focus on themselves. And, you know, I don't, I don't have any idea. <laughs> I've never been, I'm grateful. Yeah. To I think you find situation. out which, which, which one you are when the situation hits probably. But, but I hope yeah. never to find out, but I yeah. do think that it's a really fascinating question. No, fascinating. You know, I just started that book as well. I was on a panel with uh, Megan last weekend and that book, I, you know, I, I uh, started on the plane home and I, I, ha I have a deadline coming up, so I had to put it aside, but it sucked me in pretty quickly. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, really powerful books usually have themes attached to them. It's not, you know, purely entertainment. And I think in this one, she's asking a particularly, um, what's the word I want? I've already said powerful, so I hate to repeat myself. But anyway, she's asking, you know, a, a very um, important question that maybe none of us really ever want to answer for ourselves or would even know the answer unless we were put into 
a life and death situation. And then we'd see, you know, it's easy to say that, you know, parents will always save their children or whatever, but, you know, who knows? It's a it's an yeah, interesting yeah. subject to explore and pretty scary all things yeah. together. Um, so do you think that the the tech baron is becoming kind of a familiar figure in thrillers? You've got one in this book, and they seem to have cropped up quite yeah, a lot. Yeah, I feel like, you know, it's funny you said that because uh um I I did an event with uh, Sean Doolittle, and he has a tech. Uh, exactly. A tech, That's a what I was tech. thinking of, because I did too. Right. Uh, uh, in his. So maybe it's just we're hearing more about these people, and um, and everyone has an opinion. And I kind of, you know, use my characters to kind of sometimes, uh, uh, you know, express maybe my worldview on, on things. But um, not always. So, uh, but uh, so I maybe that's it. I don't know why I why I picked him. I was looking for interesting, successful uh, uh, careers, and in, in, in that instance, with the Artemis character, one of the kids uh, from the foster home who grew up to be one of these, you know, tech types we all hear about. Um, uh, it was really, you know, just that. I I needed somebody with means, and um, th that seemed to be an interesting kind of angle. But I I don't delve into that back you know the day-to-day -day of that job as much uh in the book but um but yeah i don't know i i think it must just be th they're they've become celebrities of, of a sort and everybody has a strong opinion about them or not everybody. well i think i think you know that there's that kind of money because you know we're looking around at elon musk or jeff bezos and all and you know they seem to operate in a or russian oligarchs you know any any universe that the rest of us do not inhabit where obstacles don't come their way. You know what? It really reminds me. Just had this thought because I just read a, a, a Sherlock Holmes pastiche. It's basically more arty, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really is. I'm um, yeah. just thinking about it because there he was, you know, with all that money and mm -hmm. you know the power that it brought him, and um, and a and a sort of and as a consequent indifference to. Um, other people and general morality, always this feeling, you know, they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's the tech part. I think it's that if you, you know, if you want to have really big money, what are you going to have? You're going to have a, a cartel guy, or you're going to have, you know, some sort of arms dealer, or you're going to have a tech guy and the tech guy is, you know, sort of, sort of easier. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating to me with 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 people who of that wealth what they decide to do with their money. You know, my character, the Rockstar character, basically in the book says, you know, you can fly to space or you could really be Batman and really you know help regular people pay their you know go to the supermarket and buy everyone's you know groceries and do and do all kinds of great things. Um, and so I, I I find that kind of what what the decisions are and what they're spending their money on kind of an interesting uh, topic. And you know it's easy to uh, who knows what what people are really doing with their money and 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 how much they're helping the world outside the kind of things we see in the media. But right. Um, and if you have that kind of money, is it just pocket change to you anyway? You yeah, know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, Bill and Melinda Gates. I'm you know, do they really need to focus on Africa or what about the homeless in our own country or you know, I give Bezos, Bezos credit, Bezos, sorry, couldn't say it right, for buying the Washington Post. And I actually dropped him a note because I have his email address somewhere and, you know, suggest that he might want to think about buying other newspapers because I think that having strong local newspapers is something that um, is we're lacking and it's to our detriment. If you think about what's his name, the lying guy in Congress that where his local paper actually exposed him, but nobody paid any attention to it until it made the New York Times and then it was kind of too late. And, you know, I think a healthy investigative reporter, um, you know, community would benefit all of us in an era of increasingly fake news and all this concern about chat box and AI and so forth. And I thought, you know, Jeff made a great start when he bought the Washington Post. I wish he could take it further interesting well you know i mean as you say yeah. there's so many different ways that yeah you, can, you know how you spend your money yeah I, I i think there's many of them that are doing you know um are doing a lot of charitable work and i also just know that like we hear 
about them going into space and there's a bigger picture that 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 we may not not necessarily yeah. hear about but but anyway for the book it was just fun to 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 make a make believe version of of these characters uh um that we hear about and and you know kind of riff off that so as a crime novelist do you now find yourself going around doing what if in all kinds of situations or you see people and you think you can co-opt them into a book has it changed the way you move through the world i don't think so i think I've, you know i think that if anything um you know i i'm much more willing these days to accept an invitation to something I might not have if there if it's weird and 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 might have a, a, a something I can use in a book um otherwise I'm more of you know the introvert in me is like you know I would uh, I'm not necessarily want to get out on the town every night but if something weird comes up uh, I'll, I'll take it these days you know it, it, you know an opportunity to go somewhere that I would have never gone before or anything that could give me new material that might make a scene, I'll, I'll do that. Well, the more I hang out with writers, the more I think that they're constantly asking what if in situations that other people just kind of, you know, pass by or take for granted. Yeah, I mean, I do. Th I think that's right. I mean, as you'll, I won't spoil Megan's, uh, how she got the idea for no. uh, the new book, but I mean, I think that 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 is her, her her the the thing that happened to her, the what if started and and that led to 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 the um, the new book. Um, but sure, I mean, I you know I wrote every last fear is the story about uh, a family that dies mysteriously while they're on vacation in um, Mexico, and their oldest uh, one of their sons is not with them away at college, and he's kind of tasked to figure out what happened to his family. And I got the idea for that. I was in Mexico with my family and I had a kid in college at NYU. And um, and I thought, what would happen if if uh, everybody in my family, like one night out after a long day in the sun and my wife had a few cocktails, everybody was passed out in this, you know, kind of hotel room and they all looked dead. And I thought, you know, what somewhere in there is like, what if everybody did die? And what would my son, who's kind of, you know, a, a college at the time, a very college college student, what would he do? And that was the what if for that book and it drove the whole story. I found an interesting example. My friend Dana Stabenow, who's arriving from Alaska Thursday, and she's doing a double book launch with John Sanford at the store, mm. um, took her mm. inspiration for her 23rd Kate Shugag novel because she was outside in her garden and heard a whirring sound and looked up and there was a drone. And she thought about going inside to, this is Alaska, getting her gun and shooting it out of the sky. And then she recognized that um, her what if was, you know, but if I, what if I did that and I hit something else mm -hmm. when trying to shoot down the drone? Now, my husband and I were walking peacefully along in the old town in Scotts, Stockholm, Sweden. And we heard a funny buzzing noise over our head and we looked up and there was a drone. And, you know, it never occurred to me. Yeah, did you, did you occur to you occur get to out me. a gun and shoot it? Well, yeah, yeah I guess. So. And if I had, I probably wouldn't have thought about, <laughs> you know, what what would I hit instead? So, you know, that's what I mean, is that I think there's a little trigger in, in writers that goes, what if in situations where other people think, what a damn nuisance. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's that's probably true. I, I, I think we're also, you know, uh, looking for inspiration or stories everywhere we go because it's just you you're you're always in that kind of mode of what's next and what am I gonna you know where's the next idea going to come from so I think you open yourself up to it a little more than maybe most people do as well I think so I think you're it's sort of actively looking in fact for that so speaking of what's next what is next for you um, well, I am. Uh, I have a deadline coming up uh, for my next uh, book, um, which will come out, you know, uh, about a year from now, maybe a little more than a year from now. And um, otherwise, I'm just, you know, trying to get through the day um, and <laughs> finish that. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm I. Uh, uh, and just, I have my law practice. I have a Supreme Court case that's going to be heard in a couple of weeks. So I, I, you know, I keep busy on both fronts. You know, it's, it's 
takes a fair amount of time out of the writing time that you've got to do the promoting time. So, you know, since you are in publication mode, we're on the, you know, back end at this point of what you've been doing. Um, do you, are you finding that you're enjoying that? I do. I mean, it's kind of, you know, you come, you write the book and it's, it's, as you know, it's been done a long time and you're immersed in something else. So you have to kind of, uh, remind yourself, uh, going back to the, 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 basically what was your last book, um, but it's it's a lot of fun to get out and talk about it and to get to um, see the reactions and meet readers and and uh, and you know get to um, do events like this. So yeah, I, I I it's one of the fun parts. And we you know I do events kind of a smattering here uh, throughout the year, but really in this period is where they're all condensed. And so. Um, you know, we, we want our, we want people to buy the books, but it's also just nice to not be in the room by ourselves for, you know, a couple of weeks. Are you ever surprised by readers' reactions? I mean, do you find that people sometimes find things or interpret things in your books that are not, are, that are a surprise? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, with early on, I would read every review and internalize any negative feedback and um, I, I've now just kind of, um, try to be more, um, open that, that, you know, I, I, I readers spent money on this. Hopefully it connects with them. If they didn't like it, it's, it's disappointing in every instance, but, uh, but it's part of the job and not everybody's going to like it. Somebody told me, you know, pick your favorite book or, you know, go look at the Goodreads rating for The Great Gatsby and you'll feel a lot better about any negative feedback you get because, you know, everybody has an opinion. And um, so it's just part of the job at this point for me. I try to, um, you know, and, and I try and keep, a, you know, just a, remind myself that I used to dream about having anybody care one way or the other about my books. And so, um, you got to take the bad with the good. And I wasn't actually asking you about negative feedback. I'm sorry, I wasn't all that clear. Oh, okay, sure. What I have noticed um, over, you know, 33 years of doing this is is the look of complete surprise on authors' faces when a reader asks a question. I could see the author thinking, that's not what I meant, or did I actually say that? Or how did you get to that? And And trying to to come yeah. up with a response, you know, because well, we it's, it's it's a similar thing. Like I I think that you, when you've written a few books, uh, I I can't imagine people who've written you know tens of books, um, but you forget a lot. One, you forget a lot of what you've written, and and I always before I you know go on tour or or go out to promote the latest the latest book, I have to list. I listen to the audio book just to get my head back in it because I've been working on something else. Um, and you forget a lot. I, I don't know how people who do series just keep track of all because pe people who, you know, the readers really know all it in depth. And I, 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 I think there's probably a lot of pressure to, to just keep track of all these details for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, and then, yeah, you occasionally get an oddball question, but I always just kind of find it, you know, an interesting, uh, <laughs> interesting experience. Like, well, this, well, I, that's not maybe what I was getting at, but you know, it's, it's, uh, um, and it's kind of the, the magic of reading. Everybody interprets the book differently. Everybody sees the characters differently. Everybody gets something different about it. And it's nice that someone cares enough to kind of really be interested in, in our views of, of where we were going with it. Even if we may not, you know, it may have been total accident or we don't remember. Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, it constantly reinforces for me the, the fact that everybody reads a book personally and differently. And, you know, that's why but I don't run the book discussion clubs at the store. We have three of them because I'm too busy trying to keep up with a tsunami of books coming at me otherwise. But, you know, I, one of the reasons I think that book clubs flourish and uh, author events are so interesting is that you recognize how differently people have read the same book. Um, and it's all valid, you know, and, and um, it, none of them is wrong. And, generally it's not negative it's very rare that we've had people come to the store and stand up you know and put down the book I mean that kind of thing has proliferated I think 
with the anonymity of yeah online i think that's i've never had anyone it's you know yeah i mean the whole it's kind of like real life people aren't like they are on you know no right people would never think to do the things they would do of course they are you know there's a it's just as unleashed incivility in so many respects and also it's so hair triggered that a measured response if you actually sat down to write a letter you know my friend sue grafton i mean she stuck with letters till the bitter end she would answer actual fan letters wow. that was it because you know i'm sure she felt that um well i know she felt because we talked about it that if somebody took the you know thought through and took the trouble to actually write it down and then it wasn't some kind of hair trigger reaction and you know was worth responding so I, um, I I always hope that authors don't really read their negative reviews because most of them are meaningless, and you know just try to focus on on what they're doing and the positive. Yeah, I mean I think sometimes you I, I don't go out looking for negative reviews, and and luckily I, I you know it's it's the they're not as uh, thankfully as as common. And, um, but you know, sometimes you can't. Some people, sometimes people will tag you on Instagram <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, help with, it. with your if they didn't like the book, and and so you 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 see it. Um, and you know, I, I have sometimes you learn things from. You know, I think it's you know if people, um, for me, negative reviews if they're not mean spirited um, and they're thoughtful, um, I think it's an opportunity um, to you know really think about. What, what that person's reaction was i may not agree with it but sometimes you might um the problem is 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 you know you know if you spend all day going through them all you just you know you'd want to give up the <laughs> if that's what all you were reading you just want to give up so you know you, i don't really come across them as much as i did when i was starting out and i just was almost fascinated by the fact that 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 people were reviewing my work um and it was, you know, it was just an interesting, you know, sure. kind of exercise to to read them all. Well, the mean spirited part is kind of hard to forgive. So before Patrick pops in again, I'm going to conclude with a rave review um, that you may or may not have seen. But John Land wrote a very nice review for your book in the Big Thrill. Know. Count me as a reader who revels in the secrets of the past, returning to haunt characters in the present. I'll skip over the rest of it, figuring out. What and who is the only way these characters can survive? What have we done echoes a bit of Lorenzo Carcaterra's sleepers. Hmm. Equally personal, but considerably tenser. This is a flat out fantastical, fantastic psychological noir. Let me try again. I'm sorry, I can't talk. Um, what have we done echoes a bit of Lorenzo Carcaterra's sleepers. Equally personal, but considerably tenser. This is a flat out fantastic psychological noir tale with heroes plagued by an angst ridden riddled past they can't escape. Now, there's a there's a that was nice, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know if nice. you'd yeah. seen it, but I no, quoted I it in, in our newsletter because oh, I and you know he summed up the spirit of yeah, what no, we were yeah, working yeah. on very nicely. Well, high praise. I love John Land and his work. He's a very good reviewer. I, I try yeah, he's, his he's reviews great. every month because they give me insights, you know, that um, I'm constantly trying to find ways to engage readers in, you know, in trying something. And, and he's a big help. Mm-hmm. Patrick, who is a fabulous reviewer. Patrick, come and join us. Do we have any questions or anything? This is when the screen dissolves. It's so great. Mm-hmm. Howdy. Um, yeah, there are a couple of good questions. Let's see here. Uh, Fred would like to know: uh, Do you are you an outliner? How much do you plan your your stuff? Yeah, and, and Fred, you might have heard like a lot of the thriller writers or writers in general talk about being a pantser or a plotter. A pantser is the seat of a person who writes by the seat of the pants, and the plotter is an out more of an outliner. I'm kind of a hybrid. Um, I know I have friends who do really detailed outlines. I know a lot of writers uh, kind of swear by them. Um, I I don't do that. I I just think of the book as, you know, the beginning, middle, and, and end. And I take it a piece at a time. And and um, so for me, I, I, I do a lot of thinking about the book, um, about the scenes. And once I've kind of, they've stuck and I remember what each uh character i the 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 scene i want them in that's when i write um 
but I'm happy, you know, I'm really halfway through the book before I know the ending, typically. And maybe sometimes further along than that. I remember GM Ford called it the beginning, the muddle, and the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I could call it the muddle, the muddle, and the muddle. But yeah, but uh, but <laughs> but yeah, I it's uh, it's definitely I for me it's like really really uh, intimidating to think, and maybe this is why I don't outline uh, about the book as a whole. I think I I like to think of it and just do it in parts. Because it's less, you know, there, I, I can finish that piece. And I know if I, I know from my law practice, writing briefs, you write a little piece at a time, then the whole thing suddenly comes together. And that's really how I approach the writing so the novel. A, a three act structure, essentially. It's definitely, I don't know that I, you know, that it, it necessarily, uh, you know, follows it rigidly, but it helps me conceptually, you know, just get it done. And then in the drafting, I kind of put aside that you know, the three act structure and really just go with what I think is going to move the story fast. And the middle is always the hardest because it, you know, it, it's, it's hard enough to make it drag. And do you ever have any uh, sort of what you think are going to be minor characters assert themselves into the story and, and sort of take you in a surprising direction? Um, occasionally. I mean, usually for me, I, I like minor characters who, you know, provide some either comic relief or 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 something quirky about them. Um, in the night shift, I had a character named Atticus who readers really connected with, and he was kind of a, a secondary character, but I get a lot of emails about, about him and that he kind of took on a life of his own as I wrote the book. Let's see, another question is um, just, uh, who do you enjoy reading and were there any authors who may have inspired you to write? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I get asked that a lot and I know a lot of writers. So I'm always, you know, the, the, I read a lot. I have a lot of friends who are writers and I'm just, a, a, my wife's a two or three book a week reader. I less so mostly because I'm, you know, struggling to get my own book done, but I think there's a lot of great new authors. Stacey Willingham is, is really uh, been a, a writer to watch for me. I always like Jennifer Hillier books. Um, I, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, I I want to read William Landay's new one, which I haven't had a chance to yet. Um, as far as uh, 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 writers that inspired me, I, I was in law school when The Firm and uh, Presumed Innocent came out. So I think that those were probably the 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 books that made me think, um, yeah, maybe I could I could do this someday. Um, and uh, I, I do think Presumed Innocent is, I've read it, I read it a few years ago, and I do think it is a masterful uh, uh, legal thriller. I, um, so th those would be the two I'd have, probably have to pick. You know, when Scott was here, it, was, it must have been two years ago, not the last time he was here, but the time before. It was This time we talked about my favorite television show, um, which is Extraordinary Attorney Wu, which is a Korean legal drama that is oh. just beyond fabulous. Oh, I have to check that out. I haven't heard of that. Well, Scott, Scott brought it up. And I oh. him with joy because I felt the same way. But the time before, um, I had gone back to, because it had been a while, you know, to review his work. And in the whole thing of, you know, Gone Girl and its ilk and unreliable narrators, then in fact, Scott was a real pioneer in that. You know, Agatha Christie with the murder of Roger Ackroyd is one. But Presumed Innocent is really a classic exercise in unreliable narration. Yeah. And Scott, when I talk, Scott's been super supportive of, of me and many so many other writers. But um, I did a, um, for ITW, I did a, 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 I think a class or something with him. And um, it, 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 the one thing he said, you know, he doesn't feel he's like a pioneer in anything other than he said, I, I think for lawyers like me, he made it okay to keep both jobs, be a writer and a lawyer, which is, I, th I think, pretty true because I think he still practices. Did you read One L? Yeah, I read One L before. It's actually, I my favorite so. Scott <laughs> I, yeah. loved, yeah. I loved yeah. One L, which I mean, is yeah. basically the story of his first year in Harvard Law. Yeah, Harvard. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay. And it's, uh, yeah, I haven't read it in years. It would be fascinating to read it now, having taught law school, um, yeah. you know, uh, you know uh, for a number of years. Uh, as an adjunct, I'd, it'd be fascinating to probably read it how times have changed and, ha and haven't. And how you'd react to it would have changed also. Yeah, yeah. Not just the time, but, you know, you. I don't think they could get away with 
the way they used to treat law students today, but uh, uh, back then. But I don't know the Stanford Law School, which I nearly attended. You know, I was absolutely riven at the moment by politics and yeah. other stuff. And I'm, you know, when I was there, it was Berkeley because I was there. You know, enrolled in 1958, and all the controversy and everything was at Berkeley. Stanford was so quiet and all, and now it's like a flip. It's so interesting yeah. how interesting. institutions even morph. It is. Patrick, anything else? Have you have you read Michael Connolly's uh, uh, Lincoln Lawyer series? I haven't. I haven't read. I've read the Lincoln Lawyer. I haven't read yeah. um, all the you know other than the Lincoln Lawyer. I liked. I love the book. I liked the uh, uh, both. Uh, I think there was a was there a series? Yeah, there was a series on Netflix which I quite liked. Really? Um, but uh, I, I uh, it, what, what, what's remarkable about Michael Connolly is, is he's not a lawyer and he has written this kind of really one of the top, I think what a lot of people consider a top legal thriller. Did you watch the Netflix, the first one of the Lincoln Lawyer, not the movie with McConaughey? Yeah. yeah. Did you recognize what was right in front of you all the way to the very end? No. I sat there, I said, I was just outraged. I said, what's wrong with that? I said, it's been right there all those time. How, I mean, it is a classic piece of misdirection, isn't it? Yeah, no, I thought it, I, I was surprised and, and I'm always looking to, for the, the the trick and so it, de it definitely tricked me so oh good I'm well i'm glad i wasn't the only i'm looking forward to the next season i think i love you know to see see all these great books become uh, uh series and do well matthew quirk's book as you mentioned barbara earlier um yeah. it's really fun to, to see that happen i'm happy for matthew because i think um i think it'll be wonderful for his career to have this very successful TV thing. Patrick, did you watch The Lincoln Lawyer on Netflix? Yeah. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. I do. Away. Did it surprise you too? It's, of course it did. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've, yeah. I just, no, it was really, really well done. Super well done. And yeah. I mean, you like the actor. I mean, he's not Makani, he's his own guy, but I think that um he's a very good series lead all the way it's around kind of like the uh the unusual suspects you know with uh the kaiser soze character if you remember at the very end i thought that was really brilliantly done mm -hmm. yeah so anything else um no i don't think so i think that's a, let me just check here um no that's about it you've answered some of these other questions of what can we expect from you next and so forth uh, that's about it. Well, Alex, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for no, taking thank you. Been... out of your life to spend time with us. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I've I've been looking forward to doing this with, with you for a long time. I've watched so many of these myself, so it's a real honor to be here. And thanks for for uh, the great interview. And and thanks for everyone for tuning in. Well, it's our pleasure. And now that I know with you travel with your wife, this is the ideal time to come to Scottsdale where we have super I, restaurants and part of the Poison Fan experience is having dinner. Yes. Uh, next book. Yep. John, we, John we really ought to do that. It'll be great. So let me remind you all that we do have autographed copies, still not a huge number of um, what have we done. And um, I urge you to grab one while you still can. So bye, Alex. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Patrick.